All right, folks, joining me now uh, from the Bonson Group, their managing director, David Bonson. And David, you know, you you say uh, investors are spending too much time, really, with this whole Fed guessing game anyway. I think that the problem is that most people that are making money or losing money off what the Fed's going to do, it's not long term. It's a trading play trying to front run. And so you're really playing sentiment. You're playing expectations. And then you have to unwind those trades. It's the same thing in the rate market as well. People playing on the bond side. Fundamentally, there's a lot more things going on and people are missing opportunities for real structural value. It's really frustrating to me. I mean, honestly, I, I can't remember the last time we've gone through an entire show just speaking about fundamentals. Yeah. Back in the day, it was fundamentals and technicals, but all of a sudden it's fed, 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 fed. But the good part about this, I was reading your note, is all the dry powder that's out there when the coast is clear. What does that mean? Well, it basically means when you look at some of the asset managers, they've raised a lot of money. A lot of corporations have cash on balance sheet. uh, And, of course, individuals have have some cash as well they can put to work. And so whatever the time is right for different people's situation, there's money coming into risk assets. I have no doubt about that. I think more institutional money, as you look at like these Blackstones and Apollos that have been asset gathering machines, they're going to be buying in credit, private equity, real estate at more opportunistic times. I think that's a really good opportunity. Let's talk about the, the, the story that was supposed to be a slam dunk this year. Yeah. Energy. I mean, it was a great, a great trade last year, but it was supposed to be even better this year with China coming back online. We got the EIA inventory numbers again. Folks, I want you to take a look at this. So this is a crude inventory. It is rocketed. It is now passing even the range, the five-year range. This is crazy. I mean, is this because we don't work from home? Is this because China's releasing crude? How, what explains this big spike in inventories? Well, again, the inventories is not really the issue relative to stockpiles and what's coming online for demand. And so when you look at what's ha- happened so far this year, oil started the year about $79 a barrel. It's right now about $79 a barrel, give or take $1 or $2. Oil's still in that same range, and yet they haven't bought any back in Strategic Petroleum Reserve. China may be uh, reopening, but that million barrels a day of addition de- additional demand they're expecting – that hasn't started. Everybody had to go get COVID right. and get better before right. that. That's more a second half of the year story. I don't think there's any question that at some point in the way the Russia-Ukraine thing ends, the China reopening story and Strategic Petroleum Reserve, people would be crazy to think that oil is coming back to 40 or 50. So if you have a baseline somewhere a floor in the 70s, that's a very profitable spot. If something happens, it puts it back up 80, 90, 100. That's different. It, it can be a complicated trade. You know, you got upstream, mid, midstream, yeah. uh, you know, downstream. If you had one idea, someone watching the show, not, they don't have any exposure. Where would they go? Always midstream, if I could only have one idea. <laughs> Always midstream, because everything we just said is irrelevant. What the price of oil and gas is doesn't matter. Fundamentally, midstream is moving the oil and gas that is needed to heat homes and move our cars and all that stuff. Right. It is moving through pipelines, and it's a much safer and more economical way to do it. All right. So one thing that will try to destroy the oil market one day is ESG. Yeah. Uh, but something interesting is happening with ESG. Over the last year, this is month to month. Anti-ESG regulations are coming on strong. Uh, in January, you have five anti, no pro ESG. And this has been going on for a year. You know, I started talking about this about five years ago. And people were looking at me sideways. Now it's a huge issue. What do you make of the anti-ESG movement? Well, look, I'm not allowed to come circle on your monitor. Go ahead, go ahead. Feel well, look, free, if feel I would, free. this is where it all started, is, is when... Oil started doing well. Energy stocks started doing well. Big tech started doing poorly. That was the death of ESG, is everybody got a free ride from 2015 to 2020. They all said, we're virtuous environmentalists, and we're making more money being so. And then all of a sudden, no, you're not. (laughs) Big tech dropped 60%. Energy's up 60%. Everything changed. Fundamentally, there's a political backlash. There's a cultural backlash. I'm not saying I'm anti-ESG. I'm saying I'm anti-money manager making decisions on something other than what is best for their client. Right. That is what they ought to be doing. And this entire ESG movement was leftist. It was completely pharisaical. And ultimately, the, the uh, anti-ESG movement, as we're calling it, is really driven by what? Earnings, right. a restoration of right. stock market fundamentals. Right. And also, when they start using stakeholders instead of shareholders, maybe Ooh. we'll start hearing about shareholders again. David, great stuff. Thanks, and, and, and yeah, you were the first person allowed to use a board. <laughs> Appreciate it. Too. 